What gives people power? Money? Status? Well, they might give some people power, but what gives all of us power is our mitochondria. Referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, the mitochondria is involved in aerobic respiration that generates energy for the cell. It really is a fascinating organelle and it also contains its own DNA. This is really interesting to understand, but one of the problems associated with this is like the nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA can also get mutated and this can lead to disease. Understanding these diseases and just the mitochondria in general would be greatly aided if we could manipulate the gene so that you could study the mitochondria. But to do this, you would need a tool that would enable you to easily edit the genes. This recent Nature paper may have uncovered a unique way of editing mitochondrial genes. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we'll talk about this paper and explore how you can actually try and modify genes within the mitochondria. So firstly we'll talk about gene editing in general and about the key factors you want in a good gene editing tool. We'll then talk about the development of this tool in terms of the mitochondria and we'll look at some of its strengths and some of its weaknesses and then also some of the potential applications of this tool and areas of further study to further optimise the tool and to also discuss where it could go in the future. So let's get to it. If you are interested in understanding gene editing, likelihood is you've heard of the term CRISPR. Usually referring to the CRISPR-Cas9 system, CRISPR is a system that can edit DNA by introducing a double-stranded break and enabling the cell to undergo repair mechanisms whereby it can result in insertions or deletions into the site, or if introduced with a double-stranded DNA template, or a single-strand DNA template that contains desired changes of interest, and this is referred to as precise genome editing. And so either is used depending on the application. And so there are two kind of criteria that are important for developing a genome editing technique. The first criteria is that you want it to be safe. And secondly, you want it to be efficient. Double strand breaks are notoriously unsafe for a cell. And so there's been much optimization to CRISPR-Cas9 systems to try and improve the safety and also the efficiency to go along with it. And that has resulted most recently in the development of prime editing. But to be able to modify mitochondrial DNA, an alternative strategy was required. And this is because CRISPR-Cas9 systems depend on a guide RNA that targets the CRISPR-Cas9 complex to specific regions of DNA. But getting the RNA into a mitochondria is pretty unfeasible for a cell. Secondly, the mitochondria lack sufficient mechanisms to be able to repair double-strand DNA breaks. And this is another reason why CRISPR would be ineffective for editing mitochondrial DNA. However, CRISPR isn't the only gene editing system. Before CRISPR, there were talins and sink finger nucleases. Similarly to CRISPR-Cas9, these two different editing techniques also induce double-stranded breaks. However, the key difference is that CRISPR-Cas9 directed the complex by a guide RNA Sink finger nucleases and talins required protein DNA interactions. So this circumvents the issue of not being able to get RNA into the mitochondria because a protein DNA interaction can be used instead. However, as I just said, these techniques also induce double-stranded breaks for their gene editing, which, as I've already mentioned, mitochondria don't really have any mechanisms to repair double-stranded breaks. So the question is then, how can you actually edit without double-stranded breaks? Well, the solution to this problem was base editing, which was devised by David Leo's lab, who unsurprisingly are also behind this recent paper. So base editing is a genome editing method that efficiently converts one base pair to a different base pair. So DNA contains two base pairs. You have cytosine paired with guanine, so C to G, and adenine paired with thymine, so A to T. So base editing, therefore, would change a C to G base pair to an A to T base pair, or vice versa. 
So there are currently two different classes of base editors, adenine base editors or cytosine base editors. And so cytosine base editors work by having a cytidine deaminase, which removes an amine group from cytosine, which converts cytosine into uracil. So although uracil has the same base pairing properties as thymine, so it pairs with adenine, it belongs in RNA, not DNA. So the uracil base is normally cut from DNA with the help of an enzyme called uracil DNA glycosylase, and then it's replaced with cytosine. However, instead of going back to cytosine, instead we want it to be read as thymine. So to do this in base editing, the complex is also fused with a uracil glycosylase inhibitor, which protects the uracil from the glycosylase until the next round of DNA replication, at which point the base from the complementary strand, so the guanine that was paired with the, the C before editing, is then replaced with adenine. And then you get the change from C to G to T to A. So this is one way you can edit DNA precisely without a double-stranded break. However, current base editing applications use the CRISPR-Cas system to guide the base editing complex to the correct site on DNA, which we know already is ineffective for mitochondrial editing because of the issue of getting RNA into the mitochondria. And just to make things even worse, current base editors deaminate the nucleotides in single-stranded DNA loops that are created by these RNA-guided CRISPR proteins. So instead, a deaminase was required that could actually recognise double-stranded DNA. So this is one of the reasons why trying to edit the mitochondrial DNA has so far been considered a big challenge. David Leo's group were exploring different deaminases, the entire superfamily of deaminases, and they were exploring their biochemical activity. And they came across one deaminase that actually uh, converted cytosine to uracil within double stranded DNA, which was super exciting. And they made the cool connection with the, this ability and the chance of potentially now editing mitochondrial DNA. And the name of this enzyme was coined double-stranded DNA deaminase toxin A or DDDA for short or triple DA if you want to be cool. Maybe that's just me. So taking this triple DA and fusing it with the Tarlin system so that's fusing it to these tail repeat arrays that recognize specific DNA sequences in addition to also adding this uracil DNA glycosylase inhibitor the team were on to developing a CRISPR free mitochondrial base editing system however as hinted in triple DA's name toxin adding this full triple DA protein into human cell cell lines was actually toxic for the cells. So to circumvent this, the team designed a way to split up the sequence of triple DA into two halves, an N-terminal half and a C-terminal half, and fuse them separately to different tau arrays along with these uracil DNA glycosylase inhibitors. So I've cut a very long and probably very arduous story, very short, because there's many different ways that you can manipulate the system in terms of modifying it. So what I mean by that is we know that we've now split up this one protein into an N-terminal half and a C-terminal half and fused them separately. And in terms of the system working, there's going to be differences in whereabouts you split the protein in terms of the efficiency of the editing. But there are many more variables besides just that. Also, the spacing between the two base editors subunits also will have an impact as well as the orientation of the split halves and the position of the target cytosine relative to the tail binding sites. And that's something I think I have failed to mention so far. This triple DA is a cytidine deaminase and it actually has a strong preference for TC contacts so that would be having the thymine before the cytosine residue that then gets converted to uracil. 
And so depending on the space between the two halves of these editing subunits, there could be more than one side that potentially could get modified. So let's go back to our two criteria, safety and efficiency. So firstly, because the system doesn't induce double strand breaks, but no breaks at all, then in addition to the fact that by splitting up triple DA, we reduce the toxicities to the cells, the system can be considered fairly safe, although we'll come back to this a little bit later. However, what about the efficiency? Well, this was also tested by the team and was promising. Uh, they saw a variety of different efficiency levels, mainly due to the different variables as I've already listed, but they saw efficiency levels range from 4.6% up to 49%. And so that's pretty good considering that the theoretical maximum would be around 50% because the editing conversion depends on this uracil being changed to thymine during DNA replication. And there's a 50-50 chance that it would go the other way, hence the 50%. But actually having a variety of different editing efficiencies could actually also be a very useful thing regarding this tool. And that's because unlike the fact that we have just, you know, our one nucleus containing nuclear DNA, there's lots of different mitochondria within a cell. And so there's more than one copy of mitochondrial DNA. And interestingly, a lot of these diseases in mitochondrial DNA that I've spoken about can have different phenotypes depending on what percentage of the mitochondria contained that same mutation. And so this is given a kind of cool name, heteroplasmy. So to quote from this News and Fuse article about this, this paper, a mixture of low and high efficiency triple D A cytosine base editors will be useful for creating a range of heteroplasmy levels to investigate the minimum threshold for phenotype change and clinical penetrance of known and newly reported mitochondrial DNA mutations. So going back to safety, another key consideration besides whether or not there's any double strand breaks and chance of there being aberrant modifications at on-site DNA sites. Off-target editing by triple D cytosine base editors also needed to be confirmed. For example, it was potentially plausible that you could get edits within the nuclear DNA whilst we're already directing this base editor to the mitochondria, which is something else I forgot to mention. Another component they needed to add to this base editor is a mitochondrial targeting sequence that enables the complex to get through the double membrane of the mitochondria. Very useful. But excitingly, they didn't observe significant off-target editing at nuclear pseudogenes, even though some of them differed only by one to two base pairs from the mitochondrial DNA on target sites. And so that, to some extent, could be explained by the high targeting efficiency of having this mitochondrial targeting sequence, suggesting that none of the complex is really reaching the nucleus. And that's kind of backed up by this figure here, where they've um, coloured the mitochondria using a mito tracker and also tagged the base editing complex and by merging the two layers together we can see that there's quite a high overlap suggesting that it is reaching the mitochondria as opposed to other areas of the cell. So it seems pretty safe. We don't really mind too much about having different levels of efficiency. What applications of this tool are there? Well, one of the main areas of interest would be to try and study the phenotype of different mitochondrial mutations that can cause disease, as as you can see in this figure, there's quite a lot of them. And this technique is also cool in the fact that it has the potential to edit post-mitotic cells, so these are cells that won't undergo cell division, because the repair process depends only on mitochondrial replication, which happens more frequently and, well, it still occurs in cells that don't divide themselves. So besides that, it would also be interesting just to further understand mitochondrial biology and also to potentially test different treatments along with the mutations. But given this tool, so far as we know it works on double-stranded DNA, it could be applied to other areas. So it could also be tried in nuclear DNA or other organelles such as chloroplasts. So I think, yeah, there's lots of different exciting applications of this tool and it'll be interesting to see how many studies take it on 
However, it goes without saying there are still areas of improvement, such as trying to further increase the efficiency and maybe seeing if they can edit um, cytosine residues that aren't just preceded by thymine. And if it was ever going to be used in treatments, on developing a way to actually get the system into a cell. So delivery of the system is also something that would need to be worked on. But that's kind of goes without saying for any of these gene editing systems at the moment. So hopefully you now understand how this CRISPR-free, RNA-free base editor works. So hopefully you have learned something. And as always, thanks for listening.